Mitchell, 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 nice to see you too. And then I'll be in Denver too, so I'll be talking about it. Yes, that'll be great. Yeah. And do you work in front right now? Uh, the ACLU does. I don't. Oh, you don't anymore. Okay. Anyway.
Good afternoon. Buenas tardes. How's everyone doing? All right. I love the energy in this room. I love seeing students, faculty, our invited guests. Welcome. My name is Carla España. I am the faculty associate of the Ethel R. Wolf Institute for the Humanities here at Brooklyn College. I'm also faculty in the Department of Puerto Rican and Latinx Studies. Prior to teaching at CUNY, I was a middle grade teacher. Raise your hand if you're looking forward because you were loving middle grade and you want to teach middle grade. That's what I figured. I was like, I don't know. <laughs> I'm, I will convince you. Come to my office. We will talk. Middle grade is the best. But I was a middle grade teacher in a New York City public school and also two independent schools in New York. So I am thrilled to be here to talk all things about teaching. Thank you for joining us in person and for those watching the live stream. Before we proceed, some quick points. Uh, you might have these memorized if you've been to our other events. First, if you're a student um, and you did not sign in on the way in, please make sure you sign on the way out. Two, this event is being live streamed and a recording will be posted on the Wolf Institute's YouTube channel, which means you might see the link later on your syllabus. Uh, so don't be surprised if you see some of the events show up there. Also, at the end, we will have um, some Q&A time. So if you have questions throughout, I recommend, I am ready to take notes. You will want to take notes, believe me. So have something, whatever device you're taking notes in, or pen and paper. Um, but we will definitely have some Q&A time. And because this is an event that's part of HES Week, um, I hope you're following the um, Wolf Institute's Instagram, as well as you see all the flyers here. And as you walked in, hopefully you also got that flyer about our events. Um, there are several coming up tomorrow and Thursday. Let me also thank the sponsors of today's event, uh, the UN Civil Liberties and Academic Freedom Lecture and the Brooklyn College School of Education. <laughs> Our panelists today, we have Larry Levin, educator, who has quite the story to tell of, of uh, his journey with education. <laughs> Karen Tadova, who's the executive director, director of the Defense of Democracy. <laughs> I said it slow so you can write it down. Defense of Democracy. You will want to follow them later. Uh, we have, of course, our invited guest scholar, Paul Ortiz, for Professor of History, University of Florida. He's also our Robert L. Hess Scholar for this year. We have Emerson Sykes, who is a senior staff attorney of the, at the American Civil Liberties Union. And we have Jose Luis Jimenez, who is principal of ACE Academy for Scholars and also a Brooklyn College alum. <laughs> also, we have our wonderful dean of the School of Education, uh, Professor Maria Sharon del Rio, who will join us now to give some introductory remarks. Everybody, buenas tardes. My name is Maria Chanel del Rio, and I'm the Dean of the School of Education. Uh, prior to that, I was uh, the program coordinator for school counseling uh, program, uh, master's program, and also a faculty within the uh, program. I would like to start off uh, this event um, and your introductions. You're welcoming first with uh, acknowledging that we are gathered on the unceded land of the Lenape people which include the Nayak and the Canarsi. I ask you to join me in acknowledging the Lenape Nation, their elders, both past and present, as well as future generations. 
I want to also recognize that many of our educational institutions were founded upon exclusions and erasures of many indigenous people, including those whose land this institution is located. This acknowledgement demonstrates a commitment to beginning the process of working to dismantle the ongoing legacies of settler colonialism. Thank you for the opportunity to address uh, this, you know, wonderful audience and to, you know, uh, showcase, you know, also uh, our uh, amazing panel. Um, I, some of you who have been following the panel, I gave some brief introductory remarks uh, yesterday um, on freedom to learn, and this panel on freedom to teach, as I reflected on this topic, I thought about how the current political climate in many parts of this country is impacting the education of students in our P-12 classrooms, um, and also in higher education. Um, those of, who's, of, of you who were with us yesterday um, may have heard how many young people are being deprived of access to content that celebrates and affirms communities that are often excluded from white, western, neocolonial, heterosexual, and cisgender narratives. We heard how some reactionary groups are peddling a hegemonic, distorted view of our history and our current society. And we also heard from our panelists how many are resisting these efforts and the importance of doing that resistance. Today, we will hear from educators about the importance of defending our freedom to teach and how they are doing that out in the field. As the Dean of the School of Education at Brooklyn College, it is at the heart of our mission and commitment to our communities to prepare teachers, administrators, counselors, and school psychologists to serve, lead, and thrive in schools and agencies in the city and beyond. Our conceptual framework infuses the principles of collaboration, critical self-reflection and reflective practice, social justice, and diversity, equity, and inclusion. And we stem and we try and strive to infuse that through all our curriculum and our experiences. In order to do this, our faculty needs to engage our students in discussions and experiences that help you, you know, challenge your views of the status quo, and even of yourself. So to challenge what is upon us, you, as the future educators, you know, of our city and of our country, need to develop some unique, important skills. And I think this panel will talk to you about some of those skills. And some of those skills are not those that we immediately include in our pedagogy classes, necessarily. So that then you can also exercise that freedom to teach that people currently are fighting for and that we hope you continue to fight to uphold. And that this freedom to teach is one to teach to transform. As I mentioned before, I became the dean of the School of Education. I was a professor of school counseling and I taught a multicultural counseling class. So for me, this is at the core of what my responsibilities to teach. You know, the freedom to teach comes with the responsibility of teaching for liberation. And this approach revolves around Freire's concept of conscientization and Martin Barros' application to psychology, um, which is, you know, the psychology of liberation. Both Freire and Martin Barros state that education and psychological intervention are political acts. At the core of a liberatory approach in the classroom is the dismantling of oppressive systems in order to work towards equity and social justice. This involves teaching about privilege and oppression and engaging, engaging you as students in recognizing the many ways in which we live in a racist, sexist, heterosexist, ableist, classist, ethnocentrist, white supremacist, imperialist, homophobic, transphobic, and xenophobic society. This requires that we engage and identify our institutions, the one that we're part of, the one that we're proud of, and the ones that we're seeking to be part of, particularly right in the educational system, perpetuate the systems of oppression. It also involves our faculty to support you in that struggle to acknowledge your privilege, heal from the impact of that oppression, Look at how your intersection of your identities brings many different layers of privilege and oppression that are sometimes difficult to disentangle. And to learn how your choices about your beliefs and behaviors matter. In order to facilitate these difficult conversations, you need a lot of skills that go beyond traditional pedagogy, including how to manage these intense conversations, you know, in the classroom, in a Brooklyn College classroom, because 
we hope that you take them then into the classrooms in your communities. Because this is key, you know, in order for us to be able to transform the society that we're currently in, we need to be able to manage those tensions. We need to be able to do that ourselves, so that then we can do that in the classroom as well. And this work is difficult. You know, it can be painful at times. And part of what the reactionary groups sometimes quote is, you know, to try to protect, you know, people's feelings. A very select, you know, group of people's feelings, you know, um, that need to be protected in this particular way. Um, and sometimes they say, because this curriculum can be divisive. However, what I've seen in my classrooms time and again is that when we engage in this type of, of, of teaching, this type of teaching that we have the freedom to use now and we need to fight for the freedom to do what we look at and when we get this connection. You connect with your classmates. You connect also with parts of yourselves in different ways than before. And hopefully that connection you bring them into the classrooms that you will seek to teach. And that is the freedom that you know, our wonderful panelists are going to tell you about how they're fighting to preserve so that you can bring that connection to the classroom that builds them a society that is more about solidarity than about exclusion. Thank you. Thank you, Dean. I wrote down in my notes, teaching for liberation. And exactly what does that mean? And I loved how your remarks read like how our goal should be for when we work on our teaching philosophies, whether it's for an assignment in class or for a job interview. Um, so now our panelists will help us think about that, right? And we'll start with thinking about the current political attacks on the freedom to teach and the role of the ACLU and then of the, uh, defense of democracy. So we'll start with Emerson and then we'll go to Karen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. <clears throat> Thanks to the Wolf Institute, to Brooklyn College, uh, to the organizers, and especially to Professor Ortiz for being such a shining light for all of us. Uh, as you heard, my name is Emerson Sykes. I'm a senior staff attorney at the American Civil Liberties Union. The ACLU has been around for over 100 years, and we have offices in all 50 states. Uh, and we work on a variety of issues, immigrants' rights, racial justice, women's rights, all sorts of things. Uh, but I particularly work on the First Amendment. So I'm a litigator, uh, and I bring cases trying to vindicate free speech rights. Most of my cases involve also racial justice, so the intersection of free speech and racial justice. Since we're talking about teaching, I'll also mention that I also teach at NYU Law. I teach a, a seminar on race and the First Amendment. And my parents and my wife are all teachers, so I hope I have a little bit of cred in this room. <laughs> It's a very important where we start this story. Uh, for generations, a very whitewashed version of history was taught in our schools. That's the history that I was taught in American public schools. And it's been only over the last few decades, in large part due to the efforts of Professor Ortiz uh, and many of the other folks on this panel and in this room, that we've begun to have a more inclusive story being told as a part of our, our, our schools. We now have a variety of different stories that tell the good and the bad and the ugly of American history. And in the summer of 2020, as you all will remember, people were in the streets. People were calling it a racial reckoning. We were finally, some hoped, coming to terms with who we are as a country, uh, and as I said, the good, the bad, and the ugly of our history. And so as a First Amendment attorney, I spent a lot of time defending protesters' rights. All my time was spent on defending the right to protest. It's not a coincidence that directly after that, I've been spending all my time defending the right to teach an accurate history. How we think about, how we talk about our own history, our story as a country, has always been contested. And this most recent version came about by way of the former President Trump's Executive Order 13950, which set forth several divisive concepts that were not allowed to be taught uh, in government trainings uh, or those done by grantees or contractors. That executive order was enjoined, it was blocked by a federal court, and on President Biden's first day in office, he withdrew the executive order. So it's no longer in effect, and it essentially never was. 
but it's been copied and pasted hundreds and hundreds of times into state laws, policies, local school board provisions, resolutions, and so it's worth thinking about what is the legacy of this executive order. These divisive concepts, which uh, your dean mentioned, they range, right? Some of them are relatively innocuous. The first divisive concept is that you're not allowed to teach that any one race is inherently morally superior to another. No one was actually teaching that, so banning the teaching of that doesn't really seem like that big a deal. But there are some other divisive concepts that are more problematic. Well, some of them actually don't make sense. The fourth one, I call, I call it my favorite, it says that you're not allowed to teach that anyone, quote, cannot or should not attempt to treat others without respect to race or sex. Again, you're not allowed to teach that anyone cannot or should not attempt to treat others without respect to race or sex. If you understand what that sentence means, you have more intelligence than I do. I've read it hundreds of times and I have no idea. The judge uh, in one of our cases said that this phrase achieves the rare triple negative. <laughs> so some of these provisions are just nonsensical, but some of them are very specific. They ban teaching about unconscious bias, about privilege based on race or sex, about treating people differentially in order to account for historic rights and wrongs. All of these things are also prohibited. They specifically target teaching about affirmative action. So, I know I'm short on time, but what have we done? We filed the first federal lawsuit challenging one of these laws in Oklahoma. This law applied both to K-12 and to higher ed, and I note that because it's important. We represent K-12 teachers, K-12 students, as well as organizations like the NAACP and the American Indian Movement of Indian Territory, but we also represent the, Association, the American Association of University Professors, AAUP. Because we both attacked this law at the K-12 level and in higher ed. But it's worth noting because we're talking about the freedom to teach that under the First Amendment, K-12 teachers don't really have First Amendment rights over what they teach in the classroom. Right? The state creates the curriculum. Teachers, I know from my personal experience and from my family, exert a lot of creativity and bring a lot of themselves to their work. So I don't mean this to in any way diminish the work of K-12 teachers. I'm not sure if this is still on. Uh, but they don't actually have a free speech right. They don't have a First Amendment right over the curriculum that they teach. So what we've argued is that they do have a due process right to know exactly what is allowed to be taught and what is not allowed to be taught. And so things like cannot and should not attempt. Teachers, whether you have a First Amendment right or not, you can lose your license if you run astray of these laws that really no one understands. Even the school district in Oklahoma that we sued, when they issued their FAQs on the law, they said, no one knows what this provision means. So as you can imagine, we brought that straight to the judge. And we said, look, this is unconstitutionally vague. The last second, I just want to note, that case is still pending after two and a half long years, uh, but we hope uh, to get a positive result soon. Another the big case that we filed was in Florida to, to challenge the Stop Woke Act, which applied these same divisive concepts to K-12 and to higher ed and to private employers. It was enjoined as to private employers. I'm proud to say I argued the case where we got it enjoined as to college professors as well. And so, as of now, you can still teach critical race theory in, in Florida colleges and universities. Our lead plaintiff uh, was the dean of FAMU Law School, which is a historically black college in, in Florida, uh, who teaches critical race theory. Right? This is the core of what he does, and the idea that he would be able to teach this in an objective manner or without endorsement is just absurd. And so we successfully got the law enjoined. We're going to defend it in the 11th Circuit in June. Uh, and I'll say we're very proud of this, and we think it's having a real impact on college classrooms. But, and... Uh, there are still num <laughs> inordinate numbers of challenges, even within higher ed in Florida. So uh, we will live and continue to fight another day. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much. Before we resume with uh, K-12 
Karen, who's next, we, uh, we did want to welcome Randy Weingarten, president of the American Federation of Teachers. Thank you, Randy. So we'll continue now with Karen, who will also discuss um, the work of defense of democracy. Thank you so much, Karen. Hi, everyone. And, and it, it, it really is a pleasure to be here. And I am so humbled to be on this panel with so many amazing people. And I'm so grateful to the college and the Wolf Institute for putting this together. These conversations need to happen as often as we can get them to happen, because there is a lot going on that people are not aware of, um, who may, that they don't understand the implications of, and it is a tough task to kind of bring it to the forefront. Um, we were having a conversation before we came out here talking about the correlation between Germany in, in 1929, 1930, and what's going on now. And I feel very strongly that we are in a, we're in a place right now where there is still the ability to stop what is coming down the road. We still have this opportunity. So if anyone has ever asked themselves, what would I have done? We all like to think, well, we would have been one of the good guys. We would have helped. We would have. This is what we're talking about right now. This is what we're looking at. And everyone needs to be aware of this and be talking about it. So, Defense of Democracy. Defense of Democracy started two years ago. Um, it started because in my community, and I live in New York, I, I'm a little bit upstate, I'm in Dutchess County. Uh, there was someone who ran for school board in my community, and the signage that they used was Christ is King, Anthony DeLulu for school board. And it was the kind of thing you saw it and then you sort of immediately unsaw it because it was just so wild, right? And, and I think that we become desensitized to, to that thing. But I was contacted by a friend of mine who said she wanted to take action and raise some awareness about this. Long story short, we found out that a group called Moms for Liberty were also endorsing candidates running for school board. A lot of people right now know who this group is. At the time, nobody did. Um, but I happened to know who they were because I had been watching the school board events going on in Florida and just, you felt like you're in a bubble. You're like, oh my God, Florida's, what a nightmare, those schools down there. Those people are, you know, they're jumping over the desks and they're threatening each other. And so when I saw they were running candidates up here in New York, it was, it was a moment where I really said, wow, this is serious. So I needed to, I immediately um, looked into my, a local group of parents, um, and, and we did an awareness campaign. And that awareness campaign ended up mobilizing an entire community. And I said to my friends, I said, you know what, I wouldn't do this if I didn't believe there were more good than bad people out there. The problem is that the ones who really want to shut everything down and, and basically set fire to our constitution are louder, they're litigious, they're frightening, they're intimidating, and they're bullies. And it's very hard to stand up to bullies. So really, I was assembling a force of people who would be the voice for that. Because even as, especially as teachers, you cannot many times speak for yourself. And you need a, a, a group of parents and community members who will defend your right to teach. And Defense of Democracy now, since that time has grown, we are now national. We have chapters in California, Oklahoma, Florida, Texas, you know, all over the country. And we are the definition of grassroots because we start with the premise that the, I lecture my volunteers on this all the time, we are not the ones to make a decision about what books should be in classrooms, like I'm not. The ones who should make those decisions are the teachers. The ones who should choose what's in your library is a librarian. So all of these attacks on specific books really are meaningless if you're saying, well, I'm overriding what a librarian said. So I don't, I mean, I'll, I'll have a conversation about specific books as much as you want, but it will not be me from Defense of Democracy. At Defense of Democracy, we say, it is the teachers and the librarians have the right to choose what's in the classroom. And I would want somebody with a background in library studies and education to make those decisions. So how does the grassroots movement really work and work well? We work hard and we work from the bottom. We do as we are as available, as nimble, as malleable as we can be. We have workshops, we have Tuesday calls where we have people from all around the country talk about what's going on. Um, you know, you would be, it's just mind blowing sometimes and, and heartbreaking 
Um, in Oklahoma, my volunteers were um, trying to, uh, they have to go to the, to the school board meetings, to the open comment sessions, and they have to, they've had to go earlier and earlier and earlier in the morning because what the, um, the superintendent of schools there, whose name is Ryan Walters, has done is he has put people online that he only allows about 10 people at a time to speak, um, put people online so the volunteers can't do it. So they started getting there at three in the morning, four in the morning. This past one, they were there at four o'clock in the afternoon the day before. They brought their PlayStation. They brought coffee and snacks and chairs and they stayed out all night. And there are videos on our, webs on our uh, Facebook page where you can actually see that the building was open they were using electrical cord to tie the doors shut. And, and it wasn't so much that our volunteers were like trying to break in or anything. To me, it was a very, um, it was very visual. They were trying to send a message, right? This big orange cord lashing these doors shut in front of our volunteers who, who were there and said, you know, we don't know if we're gonna get arrested. Um, this is peaceful resistance at its core. And that's what we're trying to, to, to do and to give other people the courage to do. Um, I think it's very important to realize that in New York, we are no different from anywhere else. And I'm going to give you a small example. Um, my youngest child is a sophomore in high school. And uh, they came home one day and there was a, and they were telling me about what happened in their social studies class. Okay, what happened? Well, one of the kids raised her hand and said, uh, they were talking about the Holocaust and said, I don't believe the Holocaust is real. And the teacher said, I'm not dealing with that right now. Okay, but I was so upset and it's such a complicated feeling because on the one hand, I can understand because that is going to open a whole can of worms because there are people in every district do not think that any district is safe who really believe these lies and do not believe history. And I felt that that teacher had, had left a child or children in that classroom with a grain of doubt as to whether or not that had ever happened. And that's called the chilling effect. They didn't want, probably didn't want to get in trouble, didn't want to get in an argument, didn't want to call from people's parents. And so now you have this missed opportunity to, to, to clarify. And I don't, you know, again, I don't really blame the teacher. I'm just so frustrated. So we are getting out and organizing and going to school board meetings and telling, teaching people how to speak, teaching people how to do a, a peaceful protest. We are a one trick pony. I looked around before we started Defense of Democracy to see if there was anything like this where, where our organization could be single focused on the school system because we really also want to appeal to moderates because I believe in my heart as someone who was raised by a lifelong Republican that this is not the Republican Party that we knew and there are still people out there that can, can be reached and can be reasoned with. So um, I don't know how much time I have. I don't want to take. Minute. I have a minute. OK, good. Um, uh, what else? Um, our goal is to is to create a safe environment for our teachers and ultimately for our students. Our goal is to let everyone know that this is a serious problem and that things can be done about it, that there are actionable things that you can get out from behind the keyboard and behind those arguments on social media and speak out and be heard and that Truly, the best feeling is when you realize that there are more people in support of what you're doing than against it. So that's that's defense of democracy in a nutshell. Thank you. Thank you so much, Karen. I told you I'd write that down. <laughs> I'm going to look. So for this next part, we're going to move into the experiences of educators and administrators in this Climate, right? And so we'll hear first from Larry, and then we'll go to Jose. And Larry, I believe we are going to show. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, preparing for this, I couldn't help but reflect on the words of my uh, mentor, educator and advocate Deborah Meyer, who said, you cannot prepare kids for democracy unless they experience living in a democracy. And I'm so thankful that you're here, future teachers, to uh, experience this with us. Putting this together, I have to say there was a bit of PTSD, but I'm going to share it anyway. Uh, when I put up here Florida Union Free School District, that's not Florida the state, that's Florida just around the corner from us in Orange County. So this is not far from us. Uh, as far as making this go, oh, sorry. Uh, I, I got to know the Moms for Liberty very, very well, and I always look at people's values 
when I think about who they are, and this group says they are joyful warriors who stand for truth, build relationships, and empower others. For 15 months of my short tenure there, I got to e evaluate those values. Their first uh, uh, endeavor was to look at my Twitter and to discover that I read books. And so they put together this, this flyer that was sent out, pulled tweets that I had put over the years long before coming to the district, and uh, some of them were turned into statements that I supposedly had made. White Christians are racists. Whiteness perpetuates racism. I will use my position as superintendent to indoctrinate your children. And one of my favorites, because I got to spend a privileged two years in Beijing and four in Hong Kong, they said, Chinese culture is great. At least I'm only racist against white people. This went on and then became even more involved on social media with questions like during COVID and the end of COVID in this process, Mr. Levin, is all of this reckoning with an airborne virus or are people like my daughter the virus? That they're concerned that I was investigating my background in evangelical work and being raised as a white evangelical nationalist in that type of a family and pushing back on that and learning from that. Uh, moving along with this process, this group organized people within the organization to pay for opinion pages in local right-wing papers to state all of the stuff that I and our team were supposedly doing um, in uh, radicalizing, accepting pornography into the schools, etc. when books that were in the library were there long before I arrived. And no, in the 15 months I was there, nothing really had begun under my watch that was uh, life-changing or really changing as far as curriculum was concerned. Are you changing it? Oh, I'm so glad. Um, Whenever I see you click, I'm oh, oh, that's beautiful. I'll, I'll keep that going. We're a team now. Um, again, social media, social media. Larry now is modeling the social climate he experienced while working in a communist country. Or when we're talking about social emotional learning, all the buzzwords for them, my kid isn't going to be psychotherapied. Um, going on to uh, another keyboard warrior who decided that they would take an issue from school, read read uh, something from the school board meeting, and then write an article without any fact, but just write it in, and put this out into the community. Again, removing teachers when it was called retirement. It is confusing sometimes when that happens. Um, here's one that was kind of the end of my tenure there. Um, this kind of information going out that it has been, in the last 12 months, an effort to radicalize and indoctrinate children in a culture that is both shocking and highly promiscuous. Again, not real, not true. Uh, the district introduced a program called Social Emotional Learning. Actually, we didn't introduce anything like that. We actually put together the program called Choose Love, and how dare we choose love. Um, going on to the next, this was the day I uh, was, they accepted my resignation to step away and part ways with the district. Um, this head of this organization wrote, Mama Bears are relentless, Mr. Levin. Take your pornographic indoctrination back to where you came from. This is what happens when you mess with our children in Orange County, New York, so long. Redmond, get your wings ready. You are next. He, was, he is a 20 plus year school board member pushing to ensure that public education is there for all children and this was their threat to him. They went on to say it's not about being gay. I'm openly gay. Not about being gay. But yet it says uh, the guy was a creep and always trying to push his creepy lifestyle because that's what I do best. I have no idea what they were talking about. Uh, this idea, this was the most scary. When you're out there, these are the scary people. This one was very scary. This man wrote, um, this is what happens when a Western educator in Hong Kong who's quickly guarded a reputation for extra attentiveness, attentiveness to small boys, yes, suddenly flees Hong Kong and sidles into a small rural district. And it, it, it was so shocking to me. Trust me, I called attorneys. I wish I had been able to reach out to Emerson. That would have been a, a nice thing. Although this, this is a, lead, a leader in this community. And it's so frightening and so scary because how do you push back on that when those kind of things are, are stated? Um, so values, just to be clear in case you're not sure, they're clearly not joyful. They blatantly <laughs> twist the truth. They destroy relationships. They diminish and harm others. I don't think there's anything left, right? Is that the last one? I, I, just, I just want to say that uh, it, it is not the district. It is a group of people poisoning within that district. And 
during that experience, it, the question still comes to me today. What could have I done differently? What could we as a community done differently? And I'm still teasing that out because it was so intense and so powerful. And there were so many pockets outside of the public arena as you know, online kind of things that it was difficult to push back on that. Just an FYI, I'm well and doing really great things <laughs> in, in the work and I look forward to doing more. Thank you so much for being here and I wish you all the very best. And I think something was said at the very beginning, reach out to your professors, anchor to them and the mentorship that you can, can have even when you leave here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Larry. We'll continue with Jose. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, colleagues, educators, activists, students, uh, I'm so happy to be here among uh, so many of you. Uh, I also graduated from Brooklyn College, so this has a special place uh, uh, in my heart. Jose, can you share what program you graduated from? Uh, I graduated from the Childhood Ed, the bilingual program. Uh, and I went on to become a bilingual uh, dual language teacher in East New York. <laughs> and now I'm the, uh, it was PS108 in East New York, uh, and now I am the principal of Ace Academy, PS290 in Ridgewood, Queens, uh, which I love in that community. Um, so I'm here as a principal, an educator, um, and an advocate, but more importantly as a human being uh, that is deeply committed to freedom, to learn, and to teach. Uh, in environments that respect and celebrate everyone's identity, culture, and essence. Uh, I'm honored to be here with educators, scholars, activists, and students, and individuals who share this commitment. And I want to thank Gaston and Carla for asking me to join this panel, uh, and to Brooklyn College mentors and colleagues, um, Professor Wayne Reed and Dean Maria Ferrando Rio and company for always welcoming me and to spaces of radical possibility. I am also extremely honored to be here on this panel with fellow panelists and with uh, Dr. Paul Ortiz, whose advocacy for social justice and education as a tool for liberation deeply mirrors that a collective efforts of educators like all of you will be one day uh, and are um, that wake up each day to provide education for students that is both enlightening and emancipatory. I'm also honored to be here with Randy Warren, who has represented teachers here in New York City uh, and beyond, and that I've had the honor of meeting and being inspired by as a young educator uh, as part of the AFT Teacher Leaders Program. Uh, thank you for putting this together. I'll first begin just with a bit of my personal story, uh, my journey from being a young boy in Miami, Florida, grappling with my identity to standing before you today as an out queer Latinx um, principal uh, in New York City has been both a discovery, both challenges, and resistance. Uh, I did not see myself represented in the literature, in the books that I grew up with uh, in my elementary, middle, and high school. Uh, instead, what I found uh, and encountered was a lot of silence uh, and disregard. I, I wasn't until college or close to college my senior year that uh, my world opened up, primarily having um, access to stories of different ways of existing in the world. I became an edu educator to help create classrooms were, that were not silent, uh, but welcomed everyone and moved into the leadership role uh, to expand that and create a school that was affirming and supportive to all. While that was my intention, it really only became true, a reality, when I met other educators uh, that were also doing that work. Before becoming a leader, I met a group of queer uh, educators that were having conversations about their experiences in schools, about being their authentic selves in classrooms, and grappling with not having widespread support, uh, being riddled with fear that comes with uh, being different, and contemplating ways to share their stories and really support one another. As an organization, the Proud Educators, uh, which I'm a proud member of, uh, shares and amplifies the voices of often who uh, often against formidable odds continue to advocate for an education system that values and respects individuals' identity and rights. Through our story slams and events, we not only tell our stories, but we weave a tapestry of experiences that underscore the importance of solidarity, respect, and representation. These narratives challenge the status quo, confront prejudice, and call for a more just and equitable society. 
So today, our commitment to the values of education for liberation are tested, as we heard from uh, our fellow panelists and uh, this, this from yesterday as well, uh, with book bans, anti-trans legislation, the erosion of critical thinking in our classrooms. These acts of censorship and exclusion betray the, the very principles of what education is, uh, yet facing these challenges, we are reminded of the strength that lies in our unity and the power of the stories to challenge uh, injustice. Historically, educators have been a pivotal role in inspiring generations through inclusive and liberatory teaching methods, particularly with indigenous, black, and Latinx communities. Faced with systemic barriers, oppressive policies that sought to silence their voices and erase their histories, these educators turned to innovative and covert strategies to pass on crucial knowledge and foster a sense of identity and resistance among students. These educators, like many of you will become and are, laid the groundwork for future movements by instilling values of resiliency, solidarity, and advocacy, demonstrating the transformative power of education when it serves to uplift and liberate. In reflecting on how we can fortify this calling, which is what we're all here to do, I'm drawn to the guiding principles of the three, what I call the three R's, respect, representation, and role models. The three R's that I believe uh, are critical for educators to hold close to their hearts and for those who wish to support and to stand alongside them to advocate for. These principles aren't just theoretical concepts, they are lived experiences, battles fought and victories won, and the ongoing struggle for a more inclusive and education, a just education system. They are personal, dignified, and undeniably essential to human development. First, respect. Respect in the classroom is not merely about manners, it's about acknowledging each student's humanity, experiences, and perspectives. In our school, we've, we've embraced this through initiatives that encourage deep listening, compassion, and developing awareness, recognizing that true education extends beyond academics to the nurturing of empathetic and socially aware individuals. We have signs in the building that let others know that there are many ways of being, thinking, and showing up in the world, and that teachers use materials uh, from multiple perspectives so as to not favor any dominant narrative but to voice all forms of thinking uh, and processing. Secondly, representation, which I mentioned a little earlier how important it is, uh, fosters a sense of belonging and inspires our students to reach beyond the constraints of their immediate environments. In light of recent book bans and curriculum attacks, our commitment to diversity in education materials has become a beacon of hope and it becomes clear that we have to resist the narrative that only some stories are valued and that others are not, do not deserve to be told. And lastly, role models, what we all inevitably are. Throughout my life, the role models who stood by me shared not just advice but lived examples of authenticity and courage. As educators, we embody these qualities, guiding our students through example. At our school and across the hallways of institutions of learning, we don't just teach, we lead, by, we lead by our living our truths, showing our students that we too can be authentic and courageous, regardless of the challenges they might face. When we are empowered to live authentically, we pass this on to possibility to students. Like many other great educators, Bell Hooks, in teaching to transgress educate, education as a practice of freedom, advocates for education as a path to critical consciousness, urging educators to engage in the process of self-discovery and critical thinking that transcends traditional boundaries. She posits that the classroom remains the most radical space of possibility in the academy. I close by expressing gratitude to all the educators, teachers, mentors, ancestors, and freedom fighters that came before us to inspire us and to remind us that in community, anything is possible. Thank you. Thank you so much. I told you all you needed to be taking notes. You got that down bell hooks, teaching to transgress. Thank you so much, Jose. Um, so now we're moving to our third part in this uh, conversation on um, observations based on experiences defending teachers' freedom to teach. And for that, we'll move along to Randy first, and then we'll go to Paul. So Paul, I think about a year ago, we were on a panel very similar to this. Exactly. And, and I think it was, we were, um, Paul was zooming in from Florida, but we were up at, at uh, 
I was just about to point out, we were at, at Columbia, um, and it was Kim Crenshaw who had the, a panel very similar to this, in that with a very similar group of students who were with us, really trying to push back on this whole notion. This was at the very moment where the um, AP had decided that they thought they could get along with DeSantis. And in exchange of, we all know who DeSantis is, right? <laughs> in exchange, I did love, there was a great headline today in NBC News um, online that said, I went to Florida for the sun and the sand. Mm -hmm. I am leaving Florida because of the rising costs and cultural wars. Wow. And in some ways, the best way that we can show DeSantis the door is the work that is about to happen in November mm. on the two ballot mm. propositions, including the abortion one that basically said the will of the people will prevail mm. over the autocrat mm -hmm. who defies the will of the people by the demonic mm -hmm. um, experiences that you two have both had. Um, but we were there, and you know, and Kim was talking about just this was that moment before AP and, and College Board had changed and said, no, we were wrong. We should not have given in to him, and we're going to do what we have to do in terms of AP African American um, studies and in terms of AP psychology. That's the work of all of you. That's the work of you and you and you and you and all of you in that that change. That's the work of Kim Crenshaw, who actually was one of the architects of critical race theory. But I remember Paul that day, this is when a lot of stuff had been thrown at us. He's a leader of our union in 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 um, in Florida. And he said no. He was calm, he was direct. I'll never forget this. He said it's our collective bargaining contract that is going to help create some running room for us to be able to create the freedom that we need to create. Mm. And indeed, it was and is the collective bargaining contract that when Jose was a teacher, he had, I know I'll find on your contracts right now, <laughs> um, <laughs> if you were still a teacher in Orange County, you would have had the kind of work that we have with UFF, what we have all, what, what the PSC professors have here, even though they are fighting for a new contract. But this is my point in saying this. Unions fight to improve the world for the people we represent and the people we serve. If you are a public sector union, like we are, and we are now the second largest nurse, we're the second largest nurse union in the United States, we're the second largest K-12 union, and we are now the largest higher ed union. We represent E&I, we represent 70% of the faculty that is organized in the United States of America. What you hear we are all responding to is fear. Mm -hmm. Fear of knowledge. Fear of regular folks having power. Fear of diversity. Fear of change. Mm -hmm. And the world is in this fight right now. I'm not saying that all of our democracy is the best thing. We need your generation to make it better. Mm -hmm. Yes, We do. We didn't, we pretty much messed it up for you. <laughs> but the difference between democracy and autocracy is the difference between 2024 and 1930 in Germany, and 1931 and 1933. And, and, and so part of what we're doing today is not, is is talking about lived experience, 
but also talking about hope mm -hmm. and what can be done. So lived experience, every bit, everything that Larry said, everything that Karen said, um, the, the, every single one of these stories multiplied by about 100 and welcome to my life. Because we hear them all the time. And part of what the AFT does is we show up in places as part of a way of a fight back. But the, the, the issue for me as the president of the union now is how can you fight back systemically as opposed to simply individually, as important as that is. Because, remember what I just said, the fear, they want, Karen's right, they want people to shut up, they want people to go like this, they want people not to say anything, they don't want, they don't want um, uh, parents who, who disagree with the bullies to be out there, you heard the Ryan, the Ryan Walter story, they, they do not want anyone to challenge the autocracy and the indoctrination of what is going on because of this. And if you don't want, and what they're trying to do is create great distrust. And they're trying to create an undermining of the public will in democracy and an undermining of public education pre-K through college. So the best example of this is a guy by the name of Chris Rufo who said this at Hillsdale College and he said, the way you get to universal vouchers is to create universal public school distrust. So think about all the stories. There is a doctrine behind this. This is intentional. Mm -hmm. And this is done from the top, not the bottom. Why is this so much different during and after COVID? Because COVID scared the bejesus out of people. And think about what happened in everybody's lives during COVID. The anxiety, what's going to happen? And so they take the anxiety and they try to say, let's deepen it and figure out what are the things to deepen? Race, class, and gender are the big three. What? Well, I'm sorry, religion too. So in some ways, like Larry, I'm like, okay, gay, Jewish, not liked in some of these places around the country, married to a rabbi, really not liked, New Yorker, teacher. So the same attacks that all of these folks have had, that's why Mike Pompeo called me the most dangerous person in the world. Distrust, distrust, distrust the teachers, distrust the mass, distrust the vaccines, distrust history, Distrust people who look different or feel different from you. My point in saying this is it's intentional. It's intentional. So what have we done? You've heard all the stories. I don't have to tell you more. What have we done about it? Part of the problem, and I think you said it, um, Karen, is that teachers as a result in so many places are self-censoring. Mm -hmm. There's a teacher survey from the State of American Teacher that came out in 2023, 65% of teachers are now self-censored. So if you have a principal like Jose, you don't have to self-censor because Jose will have your back. But what happens around the country? So these are the things that the AFT is trying to do. Number one, and this earned me five days of relentless um, uh, uh, antagonism from Fox. We said in July 2022, we said, we, I'm sorry, July 2021, we said we will defend any educator, K through higher ed, who is willing to stand up and say and fight for accurate and honest history and or who is willing to stand up for their kids. And we have a few of these cases, but we said and sent a message out to try to protect the individual. So that was number one. Then it was the other court cases. You heard about some of them. We have the one in New Hampshire 
which I think we will actually win. The one in, we are both on the, the one in New Hampshire. And the issue is we, we the, the key ingredient there, which is what I think the case will um, depend on, is that no one had any clue what the divisive concept um, law in New Hampshire meant or what you could or couldn't teach. And if all of a sudden you had no idea what you could or couldn't teach, and um, Emerson told you some of the examples, like how the heck do you teach? What do you do? And the state standards were saying this, and the divisive concept law said this. So we went into court and said, okay, what are we supposed to do as teachers? And the judge is like, this doesn't make sense. And I think we will win on that issue. And when we win on that issue, that's going to be really important because at the same time, the anti-woke case, one in the 11th Circuit, now Disney and DeSantis are you know, having fun together in Disneyland. And we also just won that settlement and sorry, joy is an act of political and spiritual resistance. And then we also have that great settlement in terms of the don't say gay law no longer means don't say gay. So there's a fight back, even with some terrible judges, in this. Individual fight back, fight back in terms of court. But this is the last thing I want to say. It's the court of public opinion which is as important in terms of when you're talking about democracy and you're talking about K higher ed education as a court suit. And it's collective action. If you don't remember anything else that I say, remember collective action and the court of public opinion. So the thing that we're fighting on most is how do we change this environment? How do we change it? And frankly, the most important stat, I'll do the end and then I'll, I'll do one more, two more things and shut up. The most important stat I can give you is this. Those things that Karen just said, there are hundreds of groups that have cobbled together unions and these grassroots groups. And yes, we spent a lot of money last September, in, in last fall in helping these mom and pop and mom and mom and pop and pop groups. Because if you're running for a school board election against these grass tops, like Moms for Liberty, if you believe in public education and you have a little group with you, you don't need that much money. And so we engaged in hundreds of races. And we won, meaning, not me, not the teachers union, pro-public education candidates won in 80% of those races in this September, October. Why? Because it was about simple values. So they ban books, we give books out. And we don't just give books out that aren't books you would have read 20, 30 years ago. We give books out that look like the people on this panel. And so the teachers unit has been doing that. In fact, in May, we will have given out our 10th million book. We're gonna do that in New York. <laughs> so it's engagement in these battles. We do things like wrap services around schools. We say there's a better way in terms of K-12. Let's do things like experiential learning. We're meeting, not just fighting back, but meeting parents and kids where they are and saying, we are going to do the work we need to do. And the last thing, we're fighting back on social media. We're fighting back to make sure that the social media companies and the algorithms don't keep doing this kind of disinformation and hurting kids. That's how you start aligning with parents and kids. You do it based on equity, you do it on opportunity, but you do the alignment that basically says, you want to smear us? Fine. We're going to solve problems instead. Mm -hmm. But you do it together as a group. Don't ever do this alone. Right. Do it as a group. Do it as a union. Mm -hmm. Do it together. Thank you. Wow. There was really nothing much I can say now. It's all been said. <laughs> what an amazing panel. I just want to take this opportunity to, again, thank 
Brooklyn College so much for hosting this, and especially my dear friends Gaston, Carla, Kiana from the Wolf Institute. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> Being an educator in Florida, I do not take this um, session for granted. Um, this is a session that um, we try to hold these events in Florida. Uh, but there is, as Randy said, this culture of fear. And one of our takeaways at the end, which all I can do is just simply um, repeat over and over again, and every time Randy speaks, by the way, our union family in Florida, we listen, because Randy models the traditions of solidarity and cooperation and mutual aid that are going to allow us to survive this crisis, because... We have people like Governor DeSantis in Florida, and yes, he's trying to promote a culture of fear. He wants us to be suspicious of each other. He wants us to believe that Chinese faculty and students have some kind of hidden agenda. He wants to uh, get us to believe that faculty who teach gender studies or ethnic studies want to undermine our nation's values. You know, he wants us to think that teachers are grooming. Uh, K through 12 students, and and this is something. And, and as Randy pointed out, to to defeat a culture of fear, we need to replace it with a culture of solidarity. And being a union member, it's really cool because we can model this uh, every day in our union collective bargaining contracts, which I'll talk about in a moment. But you don't have to be a union member to contribute to a culture of solidarity. Um, you have to be there for your colleagues when they're under siege. If your school board is under siege, if your principals, if your teachers, um, we have to be there when people are being harassed. You know, if a librarian is being harassed, if a library is being attacked, we have to show up to defend our public institutions. And as Randy said, we I believe we have, just to echo again what, what, what President Weingarten is saying, Randy, Randy uh, I just, I have to give you maximum respect. Um, <laughs> Uh, I see you as my leader, and I'm not ashamed to admit that. Um, but I think that it's so much, it, there's so much um, temptation in society to face these evils alone, to internalize guilt, to internalize shame, right? A lot of us deal with, uh, with these, these feelings, but only when we join together in groups or organizations. Uh, unions are really critical, but groups like, for example, the ACLU, I'm just so... We're so grateful in Florida for the work that you all are doing because it takes all of us. It takes all of the expertise you heard in this panel so far, direct action, real leadership at the school board, board level, union leadership, uh, the leadership from, from principals who have their teachers' backs. And I think I mentioned to you yesterday, sadly, all of my former students who grew up in Florida, who became teachers primarily in South Florida, have left Florida teaching. They've moved to other states. Why? In large part because their principals and their school boards did not have their backs. Okay? And it took one parent to make a complaint against that teacher. And oftentimes, Randy, that parent was didn't even have a, a student in the classroom. Right? That person was not a parent currently of any student in that district, oftentimes, if you're in Exactly, exactly. Yep. So what I'm going to do with my time remaining is to give you, start by giving you a little preview of my uh, Wolf Memorial Lecture on Thursday because it comes off of, it kind of, uh, uh, I'm going to wrap off to something that Karen said when she talked about this moment now. We often talk in Florida, Randy knows this, Florida is Germany 1930. Now, the reason we started that phrase was, was given to us by our retired Jewish colleagues. Tomorrow, you'll have the opportunity to meet another great union member from the state of Florida, Professor Sharon Austin. And two years ago, Professor Austin was part of three faculty members who, who attempted to give testimony in a voting rights case in Florida that argued that the state of Florida was trying to reduce, to, to take away the right to vote of, of many of, of our citizens. And our, the dean my college, of liberal arts and college, of liberal arts and sciences, tried to stop Sharon and the two other faculty from giving this testimony, arguing that the testimony went against the interests of the state of Florida, and after all, we're employees of the state of Florida. We can't say anything against the state. We don't have those rights, right? 
Um, and so right away, of course, Sharon and the other faculty called the union. And one of the things that happened like the day after, my wife, Sheila, and I live seven blocks north of campus. We call it seven blocks north of the football stadium. So everyone can find us. That next morning, I got a knock at the door, loud knock, out the door. It was one of my retired Jewish uh, colleagues. And he said, Paul, do you have a few moments to talk? And I said, yes, sir, I, I do. This is an amazing uh, uh, scholar, a, a revered guide and mentor of mine. And so we sat down, made him a cup of coffee, and we talked. He said, Paul, I'm going to tell you something right now, and um, I want you to listen very carefully. He said, where I grew up, um, I lost 40 members of my family to the Nazi Holocaust. And the survivors who I was raised by would talk and they would argue, and they often would not want the children to be involved in these discussions, but we listened as hard as we could to, to hear what they were saying. And one of the things they constantly would argue about is, when was the last possible moment mm -hmm. in Germany that we could have stopped this? Because they were used from German ancestry. And the consensus was 1930. That 19, there was something about 1930 that it was still possible. There were still trade unions in Germany in 1930. There was still a multiplicity of political parties. There was still opposition to Nazism and fascism that was still alive. But one, two, three years down the road, it was impossible. It was too late. And he looked me in the eye and he said, Paul, Florida is Germany 1930. Mm -hmm. This is it. This is your moment. This is the moment of the, the union, the stand up. You have to stop it now. He's saying, you know, he's not saying, he told me, you know, I'm not saying Florida is Nazi Germany, but it's on the road to that disaster. So what I want to mention briefly, to preview my talk on Thursday, I'm going to talk about Henry Ford. And you may wonder, what does Henry Ford have to do with the social movement history of the United States? But Henry Ford was part of building a culture of fear. Now, when I read about Henry Ford in my college and high school textbooks, I read about him as the creator of the assembly line, which isn't quite true. But he surrounded himself with very smart people came up with mass production of automobiles, massive props for that, uh, produced a lot of automobiles, produced a very cheap automobile called the Model T, which really had a big impact on democratizing uh, transportation. Um, those who live in New York may argue whether that was good or not to build a lot of cars, but, but be that as it may, what we, what we did learn about Henry Ford in high school was that he was a raving, psychopathic anti-Semite. He hated Jewish people. And he didn't just hate Jewish people, but he used a newspaper called the Dearborn Independent, and he used an international, the power he had, to promote anti-Semitism all over the world. All over the world. Not just in Dearborn, Michigan, not just the United States, but globally. And he was such a raving anti-Semite, he basically blamed Jewish people for all the problems in American society. And the other thing, he hated unions. And he created his own private army. It was called the Ford Service Army. And most, and, and many, if not most of the people in the Ford Service Army were former convicted felons. They had been convicted of the worst crimes imaginable, manslaughter, murder, rape. And their main job was to crush every union organizing effort. And every time his head of the Ford Service Army, his name was Bennett, found out that there was going to be a union meeting anywhere in Detroit or Michigan, he would deploy these thugs and they would beat people up. And sometimes they would kill them. And that was the Ford Service Army. How many of you read about that in high school level? We all know, how many of you know Henry Ford is though? Okay, so this is what we mean by hard history. It's not pleasant, believe me, I don't like reading this stuff, but it's really important to understand. Give Ford his props on the one hand, Model T, okay, positive net effect, um, as far as it goes. But understand that if Ford, and by the way, Henry Ford won the highest medal from Adolf Hitler that was possible to receive in Nazi Germany. Hitler uh, revered Henry Ford. And if you've ever read Hitler's Mein Kampf, Henry Ford is the only American who's mentioned by name in Hitler's Mein Kampf. 
because Ford was a model for what Nazi Germany wanted to become in terms of a technical society, anti-union, crushing minorities, keeping people <clears throat> oppressed. Okay? I mention this because the only thing that saved us from the vision that Henry Ford had, the, the dystopian, the culture of fear, was trade unionism. The unions broke through in Ford. Now, I'll talk about how that happened uh, on Thursday, so I'm not going to give you that much of a plot spoiler, but if the unions had not stopped Ford, we might be living in a very different society right now. Ford did not want to go to war against Nazi Germany. Uh, and so that's a very important thing to think about. Mass action, to echo what Randy was saying earlier, mass action is the thing that saved this country in the 30s from going fascist, from going Nazi. Because, let's be honest, many parts of our country were already one-party states, like Florida. Many parts of our country, like California, vicious racism against Asian, Asian-American people. So there, there were strong pockets of authoritarianism, of fascism, of racism, of white supremacy, but it was the trade unions that, that were able to put just enough check on that to keep us from going completely off the deep end. So two more points I want to make is that, um, and I want to give massive props to Dean Maria Soron del Rio. Let's give her a round of applause. <laughs> And in your opening remarks to us, which were very important, I hope that folks listen very carefully, you gave us a theory and practice of liberation education, of, of, of education for life, for education to improve our communities, of education to remember whose ground we stand upon, and education to remember where our wealth, our true wealth comes from, from uh, both exploitation, but also trying to heal that and make that right. And what your dean did, I'll talk about in third person for a second, is um, draw from a number of different pedagogical theories, historical theories, counseling and psychological theories. That is, she drew upon very, um, uh, I'll say, uh, sophisticated models of education and learning and research that we develop and that she learned, and I know she does research, um, in a higher education context. This is how K-20 education works together. It works from, well, I should say pre-K to K-20, right? Um, we all have to work together to learn what it is we need to learn to become effective teachers. But this is why Ron DeSantis, his kind of home stretch is going after higher education. He doesn't want the things that Maria was teaching us about in opening remarks. He doesn't want us to learn those things. He doesn't want us to acknowledge that Native American people were here before Anglo-Americans. He doesn't want us to talk about slavery. He certainly doesn't want us to talk about education or liberation. He wants us to adhere to the status quo. And above all, he wants us to fear each other. And this is where this, this the, to me, the whole piece of the puzzle has come together. I said piece of the puzzle, that's odd. That's not right. Pieces of the puzzle. Okay. Um, but again, this is why it's important for us to defend public education at all levels. And for those of us, I'll say for, for myself in higher education, my colleagues made a big mistake. And, and, and this is just, you know, this is a, a true confession. Um, when these attacks in, in Florida came down the pipeline, and um, critical race theory was banned, and when the 1619 curriculum was banned in Florida, too many of my colleagues said, well, that's really unfortunate, that's tragic for them, for those K through 12, but we're not gonna have to worry about that because we're in higher education. How stupid. I mean, look, you can have a PhD and be a moron. I'll just say that right now, right? Um, our mistake was to be silent, Randy, for too long, those of us in higher education. And we have paid a price for that because now our blood is in the water. I feel like if we had stood up more assertively as, as higher education professionals, if we had stood up the way that Maria stood up and gave a wonderful introduction, 
and the way your faculty teach you here, if only we had that kind of energy and momentum, and boy, that, if, you're an, if you're an education major at Brooklyn College, my gosh, you are lucky. Ooh. I'll just say that. You're, 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 just, you're blessed. Um, I just feel, you know, when you're wrapping up, I just feel like we really, getting back to the, the takeaways uh, that Randy was sharing with us, again, being there for each other. When you have a friend or you see a teacher or a colleague or a parent or a school board member uh, who's, uh, in, who's being stressed out, uh, it doesn't have to be one who's being attacked by Monster Liberty, but, but if you see a librarian who's stressed out, he's, he comes under attack, be there for them. Um, be the support. Mutual aid, solidarity, those are really the most important lessons, I think, that we can, we can model. Um, and the last thing I'll say is, um, again, this is what Randy, Randy kind of uh, hinted at, I think. Um, although Randy never hints at everything, she's very surface. <laughs> <laughs> Don't forget to vote, okay? Don't be cynical, okay, it's easy to be cynical in this day and age because a lot of our political leaders are cynical, right? Uh, but let's not be cynical. We cannot afford the, the, the type of cynicism that allows us to be pitted against each other. So let's stay together, um, study hard, learn as much as you can through your faculty here, uh, go out, change your communities, build great schools, great public institutions, great libraries, great unions, um, thank you for being such a great audience. Thank you. Thank, you. thank you so much. Thank you all the uh, panelists. I'm standing here because of the I'm standing here because of the collective action of the solidarity between groups of students who um, fought for our Department of Puerto Rican and Latinx Studies to exist. I'm standing here because they demanded that their um, lives and their humanity be um, seen on campus. And so all this conversation, I feel like it's a, it's a thread that connects with our history at Brooklyn College campus. And so we wanted to leave time for questions. And a lot of you have a lot of questions. And so um, we'll start, especially, you know, we have some students. So I can start with um, the back row, and then we'll move forward. Yes, go ahead, middle. Yes, you got it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just want to start by saying thank you all for coming, and I really appreciate the work that you all do um, in advocating for a democracy and emancipatory education, uh, which leads me to ask uh, what your individual organizations have committed to protecting pro-Palestinian speech and education. Thank you. Oh, wait, I'm sorry, I'm not done. Um, <laughs> Uh, for example, I've seen efforts to try to erase the Nakba from history or call it a transfer rather than an expulsion and ethnic cleansing, so just like a change in the language. And um, specifically for Emerson, I know the union is doing some defense at Columbia, but I'm curious how your advocacy has extended to the concerns and legitimate fears of Palestinian allied educators and students. Um, and the rest of your movements I've found have either expressed complete apathy or um, complete silence. So I just want the answer to that. Thank you. Thank you. At the University of Florida, so I'm a member of the Faculty for uh, Justice for Students with Palestine. So we're a faculty organization that works in solidarity with students for justice in Palestine on campus. You probably heard, again, this is, uh, SJP is one of the groups that Ron DeSantis has attacked by name and claim that he was able to outlaw, right? And so that's one of the things we do. The other thing we do is, a few years ago, when you may have heard Richard Spencer came to Gainesville, Florida, our Muslim and Jewish student organizations really got together, and our, the union actually hosted teach-ins to talk about these connections between anti-Palestinian racism, anti-Semitism, slavery, you know, eugenics, all of the above kinds of things. So we've been pretty active. The thing that I'm frustrated about, though, is that the media is not covering these amazing organizing efforts. Florida's had major, we had a, um, a march and rally, again, organized primarily by Muslim and Jew Jewish uh, and progressive organizations. We had over 300 students come out to a rally and march. How many of you knew that? I mean, uh, basically, two weeks after October 7th, and working together, 
and talking and demanding a ceasefire. As unionists, we're internationalists, and we're for peace because we know that the people that fight the wars are working class people, and, and including myself in, in my past. So those are some of the things that we've been able to do in, in, in Florida. But again, we're fr I'm frustrated because the media wants to create this narrative of campuses in crisis, divi divisiveness, right? But the students, as you know, are organizing together. Um, so you know, that's what we're doing. Sure, I think, and we'd love to share it with you if you want it. We pretty much are the only organization in the labor movement that did an omnibus resolution not only calling for a ceasefire, humanitarian aid, the return of the hostages, and ultimately a two-state solution, but to actually go after Netanyahu, as well as saying that Hamas, in our view, was a terrorist organization, what happened on October 7th was terrible, but that we need to actually make sure that people have the right to protest regardless of what they're protesting about on college campuses and the right to learn in terms of high schools and K-12. So it's a very extensive resolution, but at the end of the day, I think most importantly, feeling people's pain, this war has to end. And we have to do everything in our power. It's a genocide. Where, you know, what I'm doing in terms of the United States is I brought standing together to the United States in the last few weeks. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to make sure that everyone's fears and feelings are out there and real. Every single child who's been killed in Gaza is a life that should not have been taken. And so we are fighting to end this war. And we are fighting, we're fighting to end this war, and we're fighting to have a long-term peaceful solution. And that is what we're bringing, we're trying to do in lots of different conversations. But the other thing is, what we're trying to do on college campuses and in high schools is for people to have the tough conversations with each other. I completely respect that somebody has a view that this is genocide. I want to have a conversation. I don't want us to be yelling and screaming at each other. I want us to have a conversation. That's what we should be doing in classrooms throughout the country. So our resolution attempted to create a way to actually feel the fear and the pain that everyone has. The pain in Gaza is terrible. But we also have to make sure that we can do, as the United States of America, a way of trying to get to the end of the war and a way of getting to peace and equality and self-determination so that Palestinians have a right to a land. And for the question about the Nakba, for those of you who don't know, we have worked with hand in hand the schools, the multi-ethnic schools in Israel for years. And we um, work with them to teach the Nakba. So the same day that Israelis say is Israeli Independence Day is the day that Palestinians talk about the Nakba. And I think we should be teaching. Thank you. Yes, um, Emerson, I think Lawrence would respond, and then we'll have one more question, yes. Sure, yeah, I mean, just briefly, the SJP, SJP case in Florida was brought by the ACLU. Uh, and so, I mean, I'm happy to claim our credit for having been active in this area. And, to be honest, the ACLU stands up for a lot of unpopular voices at different times. And so it's not that we should get great credit for having pro-Palestinian bona fides necessarily, though we have been very active on this particular issue. It's also true that we defend a lot of different ideas and people who, who share them, whether we agree with them or not. Thank you, yes, there's another question here. Yes. Thank you. 
thank you again all for coming. Um, I want to stress the importance of you know emancipatory language, which is what you guys are all talking about in education. And I think the divide that a lot of young people my age have with um, your sort of language is not putting it into action or just being very uh, passive about it, right? So like you talk about um, you know the ceasefire that the union is working towards, but like you're sitting here drinking a Starbucks cup knowing the reality of the union at Starbucks being sued for using the words free Palestine, right? So it's like that type of irony that a lot of young people my age are frustrated, right? With, we come into these clashes and we have very um, radical conversations or seemingly radical conversations, but then the same educators that are supposed to be empowering us are um, very, you know, practically sitting down or just speaking in language that is super passive and um, not putting that uh, radicalism into work, right? Um, and there seems to be something very unique about um, uh, education when it comes to the suffering of Palestinians, right, is that there always has to be a conversation of, we are concerned about all students. We want to make sure, which is, there's nothing wrong with that, right? But the unique um, problem there is that when Palestinian students or educators raise their voices, uh, there's always a conversation of all, right? Let's all have this conversation in the same ways that uh, the 2020 protests have brought up the same language of, oh, we, um, we care about all lives, right? Like, all lives matter, right? When we're talking about the suffering of black and brown students or uh, black and brown people in, in general, and there's something very unique about that, right? Which is that um, pro-Palestinian educators are unique in that experience. The anxiety is very much unique, right? Why is it that every single facet of society is um, antagonized by Zionism and bullied by Zionism, right? It's very simple to say, like, everyone's feelings are being hurt, but, like, you guys as educators know that when it comes to higher education, sometimes your feelings are going to be hurt, and it's going to come at the expense of, um, <laughs> frankly, white people that, are, that feel antagonized by being called out on their uh, privilege. So I just wanted to make that uh, statement in that point. But I want to know in all of your experience, do you feel that um, that, that statement is true, that the reality is uh, pro-Palestinian educators um, are antagonized in a lot of other ways that maybe critical race theory advocates are not antagonized, right? So like here on Brooklyn College campus, that's a, that's a big issue that we've had. Um, on CUNY campuses in general, right? Professor of Latinx studies, I'm not sure if you're aware of him, uh, Paul, but he he uh, studies the same exact uh, you know the same particular uh, exper expertise that you've been at right so Latinx studies, um, and this is not even something that you know he studies as far as Palestinian suffering, but he's recently just been fired for his advocacy for Palestinian uh, speech, and then um, here at Brooklyn College campus we've had the same type of fight and it's gone back as far as a decade, right, Professor Adjunct uh, Peterson, who's being fired, who was fired for the exact same thing. And this is a consistent fright, right? So we're talking about solidarity, we're talking about uh, coalition building, but we're not seeing it put so much into action, or we're, we're hearing words that are very, very passive. And it's extremely, I'm sure that's why that student left, um, uh, aggravated the way that she did, right? Because we're learning about these words, we're understanding how to put our suffering into words, but then the same educators or people that seem to put collective power to use are not actually doing the work that should be done. So if I could, if I could turn that question to, so what happens, to, like let's say we'll say in your, in your school as an administrator, in support of your Palestinian, Palestinian American, and Arab American, uh, those of us in solidarity, saying we're concerned about this genocide, and we'd like to amplify the voices of our Palestinian authors with books. So I'm a teacher in a school, and I want to read Homeland. My father dreams of Palestine. What do I do as a teacher, and how do you protect your, you know, Palestinian and those of us who support um, Palestinian teachers? Like, like yeah, I want to read that book, right? I want to read Homeland. My father dreams of Palestine. One of my favorite picture books. What do you as an administrator do to support you, the teachers there? Yeah, I mean, one of the things that, um, first I just want to say and honor all the, uh, you know, the voices that were just lifted and all the thoughts. Uh, it's not easy being an educator. It's not easy being um, a human being right now. Um, so in, in my context in a school, uh, you know, our library is really one of the beacons of where where the students are able to see themselves reflected in the stories. So we have sections 
uh, in our library that represent multiple perspectives. One year we audited our, uh, this was uh, 2019, we audited our curriculum using NYU's um, uh, curriculum scorecard for culturally responsive and sustaining texts. So teachers, students, uh, and it was great to see kindergartners tally up how many books had people that looked like them, um, people that didn't, uh, they, they, you know, they tallied them up, uh, and then requested books. Uh, our GSA in our school uh, fundraised for money to bring books into each of their classrooms, so they self-organized and said, we don't have LGBTQ books in the library, this is our fourth and fifth graders, and they um, raised money and bought books for, for their peers, and they went to classrooms uh, advocating for that. So it does, as Brandy mentioned, leaders make a difference. You are all gonna become leaders in your classrooms uh, if you're studying to be a teacher, um, and it does come from the top as well. And then many of you will you know, become leaders yourselves in schools, in educational systems, uh, and it is a fight. There is a level of um, um, standing up that has to be done, and, and to your point, um, sometimes it's, there's too much rhetoric and people are not doing what they say they're doing. Um, and, and that's why the public is important to be engaged. So with families, uh, having conversations about what they want, want to see in their schools uh, is key. Thank you. And I think Karen, Karen wants to respond to that, that as well. Thank you. I just, I wanted to respond just in my little microcosm of what I've been doing and seeing with the volunteers at um, my organization, it is taking action is critical right now. So that's why part of my remarks were highlighting the fact that we need to get out from behind our key keyboards and organize. So having, there are organizations, I'm gonna talk about mine because I'm, that's the one I know the best, but there are so many that, that are taking action. And so putting in place a structure was one of the first things we did. So that when, when someone starts a defense of democracy chapter, you've got, a, you've got certain specific roles. And this is getting a little bit deep into um, community organization, right, and community mobilization. But you need to have a hierarchy, you need to have job descriptions, you need to have an action plan, you need to have something to work towards. And, we, and to have these trainings. And it takes a lot of time. There are so many amazing people who I work with from high school kids on up to like octogenarians who are willing to put into the work and do this. I've had with, um, with one of our events where it was actually Larry Levin's one where we had our, our, we mobilized around the Florida School District and one of our um, supporters from, from, came from Buffalo, New York, this amazing woman. She is a transgender uh, Navy veteran and drove down in a blizzard to attend this just to stand there and, and lend her, her support. So there are action items that I, I mean that need to be taken and I am a big person of not sitting back and passively doing things and people don't always realize you can write a letter to all of these things, by the way, give people courage who are sitting around you to stand up. It's very hard to be the only person to stand up. So it is important to, to go. I was just hoping you guys can see Trump. So like, I love this type of language, right? This energy is amazing. But I wanna, I wanna see how you yourself are putting into action or just how you'd like to put it into action in the future, right? Okay, so I'll give, it, I'll give you an example of how I personally am putting it into action. In my school district, there was a walkout by a group of students who were anti uh, 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 the trans kids in my school district um, were targeted and have been for many years. And we have gone consistently to the school board meetings to speak out and we have written letters to the editor and we have been had conversations as much as we can to be as loud as we can. Okay, I will say that defense of democracy and this is something that we specifically defend teachers. So if someone wanted, if there was a, a teacher who was Palestinian or wanted to teach a Palestinian history or, or pr promote a book, that, and they were unable to do so, there would be a physically getting up and attending the school, reaching out to the teacher, and really the conversation starts with how can we support you? So as soon as we have that conversation with the teacher, like we did with Larry, to see like what is needed, because every community is different, um, that's the first thing we would do. I mean, that is just, again, the, a small, growing grassroots organization.
But that's why we say, you know, if a teacher, if someone has gone to the trouble to get the education, invested their own pro time and money into learning what they want to teach, we would want them to be empowered to do that. Th that's where Mara is. Thank you. And we'll take one more question. Hi, um, so my question is for Randy. I'm curious, you've been an organizer, a president for your union for 15 years or so. Um, what are differences that you can notice in between issues then and issues now? And can you talk about um, substantive issues such as resource drain that you do experience fighting for the issues that you do have to fight for now? Did you just say resource drain? I'm sorry. Yeah, like draining of resources or just trying to have to like put anything or rather put everything against this one issue that, for example, DeSantis or New Hampshire or any of these places are bringing forth to towards So, so I think part of, I think I can answer your question and um, tell um, the, the student who asked the question about action earlier at the same time, which is that the most important thing that we have as union leaders is a sense of, is there a connection and a sense of credibility with each other? And, the, and you have to be able to walk in your own shoes and in each other's shoes to create that sense, that sense of trust. And so, whereas the, the question becomes, even in the conversation in terms of Palestine and Israel, there's a lot of different views in this room, a lot of people have left, there's a lot of different views in this room about what to do. And there's a lot of feeling of anguish and harm. And if you don't, as a labor leader, if you can't see people for who they are, you can't get upset that somebody, you know, is upset with you that you're drinking Poland Spring or Starbucks or this and that. You have to learn that you gotta be able to walk in each other's shoes and have a basic compassion for what people are going through and create that trust. And I would say that over the course of time, that has become more and more and more important to me. How we create trust amongst and between a lot of people who may not agree on everything together. So we're a broken college right now. But if we were in a high school in Wichita, as opposed to a college in Brooklyn, you would have a different view in that, in that group of students and faculty and you have right now, it would be more, it would be a more conservative view. And so if you represent people in Montana, if you represent people in California, if you represent people in New York, trust becomes your calling card. And how you actually fight for core values and how you bring people together, but honor their different views on it. And so the key is, from my perspective, we have to be able to hear each other and create a safe space for people to have a conversation and to be able, if you're going to be an advocate that, that believes in solidarity and mutual aid, you got to be able to create that container of it, even when people may have very different views about a particular issue. And then on the things that are core, look, life and death is core. War and watching kids get killed, that's core. You have to be able to say, we're fighting for a democracy that's better. We're fighting for a quality that's more. We're fighting for the immigrant, like those six men who died on that bridge. We're fighting for diversity, we're fighting for the immigrant, we're fighting for humanity. And we're fighting for the resources that do that. So we have to fight for the trans kid. And we have to fight for the Palestinian professor who just got fired, who should not have gotten fired. We have to fight for the Homeland book to be read. 
But we also have to fight for those Israelis held hostage and try to get them out. And so that's why the issues, the fear is much worse right now. The fear of the other is much worse. Mm -hmm. The issue around whether or not we will lose our democracy is much worse right now than 20 years ago. I think that this could be, this is the most consequential election since the Civil War. I would say since George Washington decided to be a president, not a king. The finance issues are really tough, particularly in college, student debt, the potential of what it looks like in terms of the economy. But really, truly, what I see differently right now is the fear of the other has gotten so um, rooted in our society that we could lose this election and our democracy because of the level of anger and the level of fear. Mm. And how do we bring enough people together, even with a different view on whatever issue it is, to say we should be about caring about each other and about an America that looks futuristic, that holds each other and fights for the opportunity. Thank you. So I want to leave you with um, two remarks before we, we wrap up. And the first um, is from one of my professors, Ernest Morell, when he was a National Council of Teacher of English uh, president at the time. Um, he was one of my professors, and we were reeling from a lot of anger at that time, and he said, sometimes your solidarity might look like a Frida Kahlo portrait, and sometimes your solidarity and activism might look like a Diego Rivera painting. So what do you know about Frida Kahlo portraits? They might be small, impactful. Diego Rivera murals, like massive. Um, and so I want to leave that with you, especially those students who are going off to students who are going off to teaching, like find in this conversation, your solidarity and your activism might look like a Frida Kahlo painting, or sometimes it might look like a Diego Rivera mural. And I'm so privileged and so honored to teach at Brooklyn College. I love CUNY, I love Brooklyn College, I love our students, because you are pushing our thinking on what that solidarity and what that activism looks like. The second thing I wanna say is I've always appreciated the James Baldwin quote on we can disagree and still love each other unless your disagreement is rooted in my oppression and denial of my humanity and right to exist. And I think we've heard not only from our panelists but also our students today on the urgency to be in solidarity and to advocate to make sure that the humanity of um, especially the most vulnerable and the least represented populations are um, advocated for. And so I appreciate um, the words that were shared today in this room. I want to encourage you to keep uh, joining the conversation on our live stream. We have four more events, two more tomorrow and two more on Thursday, where Professor Paul Ortiz will also be giving the lecture. So please join us. Keep bringing us your questions. Seguimos la lucha adelante. Thank you. Just to chat with her, just to say.